Hello and welcome to the Sonic Cinema Podcast. My name is Brian Scuttle and thank you for joining me at www.sonic-cinema.com as well as the Sonic Cinema Podcast YouTube channel. You can click subscribe, rate, and review wherever the podcast is available. And uh, whether it's Good Pods, Apple, Spotify, uh, pretty much anywhere podcasts are available, you can find it. And uh, any subscriptions, likes, shares, all that is appreciated. You can also join us at patreon.com backslash Sonic Cinema. There you will find a life soundtrack, losing the collection, uh, brief thoughts on older movies I've watched for the first time, including actually three, all three of the movies that we are going to be focusing on today, um, and as well as more, including uh, film festival coverage, Oscar discussion, all of that is at patreon.com backslash Sonic Cinema. So I think everybody who is a movie lover, I, I think everybody has certain blind spots in their movie watching, and I certainly am not alone in that. I, I in the past few years, uh, filmmakers have I've finally really started to dig into the work of John Cassavetes as well as today's subjects, and that is the directorial team of Michael Powell and Emmerich Pressburger, better known as the Archer. I'd seen Powell's Peeping Tom several years ago, but I'd never seen one of their collaborations until a few years ago when I watched one of the movies that we're talking about today, and they're our subject. And join me once again on the podcast. We had wonderful discussion on Barbara Stanwyck last year. I'm so glad to have him back. Uh, please welcome back to the podcast, Matthew St. Clair. Matthew, thank you very much for joining me. Thanks for having me again. Before we uh, get started, where can people find you online? Yeah, sure. You can follow me on Twitter at filmguy619, Instagram, matt.saint.clair92. And you can also check out my freelance work at places like Awards Watch, The Film Experience, In Session Film, or and also my my Substack, Cinematic Words of a Chaotic Gemini, at matthewsinclair.substack.com. Okay, excellent. And uh, like like I said, I absolutely love the uh, discussion that we had on Barbara Stanwyck. I know another one of your favorite actresses from the golden age of Hollywood is Deborah Kerr. And I know you've professed your love for one of the films that we're going to be talking about on line several times and so that's kind of what made me uh, uh, have the idea <laughs> of having you talk about the archers with me what what, what has been your experience with uh palin pressburger over the years well i remember my my intro was uh, my intro was peeping with my just michael powell with peeping tom mm -hmm. which i know was critically derided when it first came out but it's uh and an absolute masterpiece that helped, uh, which helped give birth to the slasher genre. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I mean, yeah, I mean, I I know uh, by that by the time I saw Peeping Tom, I knew I I was aware of the reputation it had when it came to filmmakers and how influential it was with filmmakers. So I mean, you know, obviously the critical derision was somewhat surprising to me because of the fact that when you watch it, it's such a visceral piece of filmmaking in terms of how it uses filmmaking as part of the story and the way yeah. it uses the camera as a fundamental part of the terror in that movie. And one of the things that I, as I was going through the three movies that we're going to be talking about with, the Archers, one of the things I was so thrown, was so struck by is that I often, I mean, I think a lot of people often have a very, a very common way of looking at the golden age of Hollywood and the way that the camera moves and the way that sound is used, the way that color was used in the 
40s and 50s. And, I mean, now, granted, I mean, so one of the things I find so interesting about their work, and, I mean, they are, uh, they're from, uh, they're British filmmakers, so they're not working within the Hollywood system, is you look at something like The Life and Death of Colonel Blimp, especially, and it feels very much like a biopic in a lot of ways, but it moves in a way that is, it, it moves, it has a pacing, it has a feel to it that really is almost unlike anything we really see in the genre, even now. Yeah. Oh, definitely. I think mean, one way it does so is by, uh, partic- particularly as, as a way of, sh- as a way of, uh, and uh, one way of doing that is through Deborah Carr's performance and how, mm-hmm. he, as she plays three different women, three different women who are like products of each time period the movie fo- follows us in. Yeah, the thing that I'm the thing that I am struck by is so much about the performances by Carn. I you know, and it's a shame that this. I mean, I I think between for Cine, certainly I think this performance probably has a lot of the same acclaim as, say, Peter Sellers and Dr. Strange Love, who is very well known for playing four different characters. So the fact that, but when you when you think about her in this role, I, I love how each performance is very distinct from one another. She's not just playing different versions of the same character, even though that is basically the projection on general Candy, the idea that these other women are basically reminding him of this English woman he met in Germany and had, and almost in a way, has never gotten over. And I, I think that's such an interesting, it's such an interesting choice in the storytelling to have Carr play all three of these characters and it's it's one that makes all the sense in the world because of the fact that ultimately this is this is essentially about candy's uh perspective of the world and that's one of the ways in which he he sees his world unfold oh definitely and i think what's also genius about cars performance even though you can you can tell even though it's even though she never uh, like physically, she doesn't alter her voice or her, mm-hmm. or go through makeup. She you could you could still she still finds ways to. It's always in like her, at least her her demeanor or her attire or where it's where it's clear that she's playing three different people. Yeah. No, definitely, and um, I, there... well, I I do. Sorry. No, go ahead. I I mean because I I always like to do a personal awards ballot. So what, where where do you think Deborah Carr would fall, lead or supporting? Deep down, I would I would like to say lead because obviously she is the main female presence in the film. But I mean I can you can certainly see where somebody would say supporting just because of the fact that she's not playing a single character throughout. But at the same time, and, and, I, I can't imagine her anything other than a lead. Yeah. And then again, she is mostly told through the protagonist's point of view. Yeah. So, mm-hmm. I mean, I guess I would say, I mean, it's, I mean, it's not as bad. I mean, like if she were like nominated and supporting, it wouldn't be as like with Rooney Mara and Carol. Yeah. Or that, it wouldn't be that level of egregious, but mm. I, I would get the, the yeah. supporting yeah. argument. I mean, I would, I would obviously prefer in Lee. That would make the most sense to me because she is, she is the main actress in the movie. I think she's just as important as Live Z as is in the film and I I think it's it's just that important of a role. I mean, you know, it. I mean, especially if look, especially if 
I mean, you know, it's obviously a go-to when it comes to, you know, questionable categories. But, look, Anthony Hopkins got nominated in lead actor for 25 minutes as Hannibal Lecter. But he got nominated in lead because it's such an important performance in the movie. And such an important character in the movie. That's why he has such yeah. a presence in that movie. And, I mean, I, I think you have to use the same logic for Kerr. And she's she's wonderful in this movie. Her and Livesley just have amazing chemistry in this movie is together. And it's just absolutely wonderful. Oh, definitely. And, I yeah, mean... You, you get to... You get to... And I mean, I I love that you know it's like this this movie to me strikes strikes me a little bit like um, Citizen Kane, where it's, you know it's it's an original creation by Palin Pressburger. They're not adapting somebody's work. It's basically it's basically their take on a biopic by using a fictional character, and they're using a fictional character to reflect on the ways in which people viewing the British Empire in one way are are real have life kind of passing them by in a way. And I, I think that's that's one of the most striking things about the film from a thematic level. But I I love the fact that it's it's just this is just a genuinely entertaining movie all the same. It just has an energy to it and an excitement to it that we, I don't think about the fact that this movie is two and, two and a half hours. It, it's just that compelling the entire way through. When I saw oh, this, yeah. it's like, how is this, how is this, wow, I'm not sure how I'm going to feel about this. I ended up loving every minute of it. Yeah, the, the three hours do sort of, I mean, it sort of, as I recall, it just sort of lose them in. Back, but I, you know, entirely feel because I know I'm one of various insufferable Twitter discourses is movies are too long. <laughs> movie, why, why, why is it the mini theory, not a movie? Yeah, <laughs> I, I care more about whether the movie earns its runtime. Yeah, because I've seen I've seen movies that were too. I've seen movies that were hundred minutes. <laughs> felt longer than Carl Lund. Yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah, I mean, definitely. I, I mean, Killers of the Flower Moon was 200 minutes, and it felt shorter. It felt shorter than movies that I've seen that were 90 minutes. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> you know? Mm-hmm. You know, and no, absolutely. I don't, I don't have a problem with length. Just does, just does the movie earn its run time. Yeah, exactly. I mean... Roger Ebert really said that's like no no long no no good movie is too long, no bad movie is too short. And I mean it it really it get that is on, that is the only important thing to really take into account when it comes to running length running time. It isn't not that oh it's like three and a half hours, it's but how does it move? How does how does the story progress? How does it hold our interest while it progresses? And certainly, I mean, there are definitely moments where you can say, yeah, I mean, yeah, there there are some things, especially, um, you know, especially when it comes to some of the middle passages that that get that that can get a bit bogged down. But at the same time, we're always interested because the characters are interesting, and I I think this. You know, I. This is one of those movies where I was really struck by one of the things I love about this film in particular that really resonated with me was the the friendship that um, Candy has with the German soldier they ends up having to duel with, and. It's it's striking because of the fact that in we we see how that friendship progresses even as the world changes. And I I think that is something that is 
that that's something that really resonated with me in this the idea that two people from very different walks from two di- very different countries two very different ways of looking at the world they maintain this friendship throughout decades that is just absolutely just fascinating to watch and even even when um even when Kerr's character gets in the middle of that it doesn't impact their friendship and i love that i i love it it just deepens it to a certain extent and i seeing seeing the way it plays out over the decades as this film progresses and as this story progresses is just one of one of the uh, wonderful aspects of this film for me. Yeah, definitely. I I am you know, and and the thing is, it's like I this this movie. This was the first one I watched for this uh, this this podcast, and I I think the thing that struck me so much in this, and it it's something that you do kind of. Probably because this was a little bit earlier than the other two movies we're going to discuss. There, there's an element to this movie that ver- feels very theatrical, like it feels very much like it would be at home on the stage, but at the same time, it is very cinematic in the way that they shoot scenes, the way that they cut scenes together, the way that we get the use of music, the way we get use of color, the way we get used to artificiality, it's it's something that's very natural to this film in a way that really kind of disarmed me. And I think that's part of the reason why this was such a great one for me to start out with for this particular podcast, because it's like, okay, this is this is doing... And especially because of the fact that I think to a certain extent they they do manage to get away from the theatricality, theatrical trappings of early cinema in their later films. Um, the fact that they make it work as well in this is really quite extraordinary. Yeah, it, 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 it was, I mean, the, I mean, it's, it's, the, the, uh, the ten, translation to the stage thing is definitely interesting. I mean, at least the, at least the three, Three act structure, no well, three act. Yeah, it would. It would the whole. Uh, I, I think. I think it would. I, I think it would benefit from the uh, transition to the three three act structure that Apple. Yeah. That Apple comes with. Yeah. Yeah. But at the same time, you also I I the the way that we get a whole lot of genres in this film, and I think that's this is something you were. Um, Point to earlier where there's it's obviously a war film there's also moments of physical comedy especially in the hospital there's genuine comedy that plays out when it comes to the duel I think is very funny where we first see Candy and Leo together and then there's just this there's this romantic yearning in Candy that is really <clears throat> it it's not just about his relationship to his country and his service to his country, it's also romantic relationships. But at the same time, we also kind of get the there are also times where we do kind of feel like I think he is somebody who um who is content to in in the life that he's chosen? I mean, I definitely, yeah. Well, one could look at this him candy yearning for the that uh, candy yearning for the uh, love of his life as a as a abs- absurdist demonstration of a. The, the the familiar story about the the one that got away. Yeah. You know? Yeah. But yeah, this this movie to me is just really it it was really just a wonderful um it it was really just wonderful to take in 
for the first time, and I I I loved uh, I love that it really gave me a sense of these filmmakers. I mean, even even though even considering the films I had seen of theirs earlier uh, earlier in life, this this movie is so wildly different from them. You do get an impression of what they were like at the start, and I think that is. I, I think that's always I think that's always an interesting thing to see when it comes to filmmakers and especially uh, especially when you have these guys who are um, such such absolute craftsmen who understand the importance of what the camera adds, what color adds, what different filmmaking techniques, what different editing techniques add to. A film and it's just absolutely beautiful. Absolutely. I uh, the did you have anything to add about Colonel Blimpy before we uh, continue? If if you have three hours, definitely uh, check this. Definitely, this is definitely a a good use of use of a good use of your time. Yes. Uh, and if you still have Max, I know it's. Yeah. available there that's where i saw it and i i had an absolutely wonderful time watching this uh we're gonna go on to the next film which was made by them in 1947 also stars deborah carr in a very different role and this is it's funny because of the fact that i i watched this again this was the first one i had seen of their films and it absolutely blew me away. I I just was I have to watch more of their work after this. It is 1947's yeah. Black Nar Black Narcissist. And it mm -hmm. is adapted by from the novel by Rumor Godden is about um sisters who basically are tasked with setting up a school and hospital in the Himalayas and the psychological challenges they face in that uh, in that process. I, you know, it's funny because of the fact that I don't know what exactly was that made me choose this as the first Pal Pressburger that, that I watched, but it it definitely it definitely made me feel like I'd made a good choice because of the fact that I think oh, no. what I think what this film does is that I, I think there are things about it when it comes to faith. I think there are things about them when it comes to missionary work, when it comes to people who are kind of thrust into an extreme situation and they're struggling with figuring out how to navigate it. And I, I think that is such a, that, I mean, that's, that's only, a, that's only part of what this film is about a hundred minutes. And there's so much in this movie that is just absolutely extraordinary. Like uh, this is my, this movie was my own intro to the archers. Mm -hmm. And, and also it's, I, I love it so much that I always make it my, my mission to watch it on Easter or Christmas. <laughs> Fairly outside the box, but yes. <laughs> uh, I mean, I'm, yeah, yeah. I'm just like, sure, I, don't know. I don't like to always watch the usual suspects. Like, yes. I mean, while well, Colonel Flint was like a war, was like a romantic comedy in her times. This, this is like a more like a more of a psychological horror drum, horror film. Yeah. But no, I, I I definitely agree with you on uh, the the wildly different um, genres. I mean, you you do have essentially a romantic comedy as well as a as well as a horror movie playing on uh, Colonel Blimp. Uh, with Black Narcissus, it is very much a psychological horror film. It's almost in a way, it's almost a uh, it's it's almost a uh, training ground, I guess, for Powell for what he would do later. And, uh, peeping Tom, but I mean, it certainly right. doesn't go to that extreme when it comes to horror. 
but I I think this is this is the type of movie. It's it's ultimately about survival, and certainly about it's. Yeah. I I think at its core, it's about that, and I I think one of the things that is really. I think one of the dynamics that is so interesting in this movie is the fact that Carr's character, Sister Clauda, is relatively young, and she's the one who's being put in charge of creating this school, creating this um, hospital, and basically leading these women, some of whom have many, many years on her, in telling in in creating this environment for them and in a way it's almost a challenge to her to you know it, it's it's almost like throwing her in on the deep end as in terms of her ability to lead and i i think that is one of the th and then you see the ways that some some of the sisters uh react to hers the way some of the sisters almost seem like they're challenging her and it's i i think it's such a fascinating use of uh dynamics and the fact that the the main character is as young as she is in this type of verse in in this type of uh role i i think is one of the most compelling parts of the film yeah, I didn't think about that. I definitely, I definitely didn't think about the youth factor. I mean, it, this is... I, I cannot say enough about Powell and Pressburger in their cinematography, in the way they use color in these movies. And I mean, obviously, <laughs> it's a very thinking. generic thing to say based on like everything I had read about them before. But the fact is, it's just so remarkable. And I mean... We're not even at arguably the most remarkably visual film that they've gotten to yet. Um, but I think this one, the way they use camera angles, the way they use shadow, the way they use um, light is, is really important to how this story unfolds. The way that we get sucked into the psychological reality of this story it's it's just incredibly important to how how this film plays out to us and i i think it's it's just absolutely breathtaking to see these to see the ways in which these characters ultimately mean well and try to do their best but they but this environment this particular environment almost gets the best of them in like every yes. way yes especially kathleen byron as sister ruth yes yes oh my goodness <laughs> uh yes. I, I yeah i i yeah if i if i can't fall in love with a a hot British guy, I would go on to break of insanity like her. <laughs> That's just me. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you know, I mean, well, like she, in, in the even, thing... even... No, go ahead. Even though there's no supernatural elements involved, she does play her like she's a woman possessed. Yeah. Yeah. Even, even like the way, like as we were talking about the use of shadow, like the the glimpse of her uh, like, like grinning at Sister Clotta mm -hmm. with while the shadow is covering her face, it's it's, it's bone chilling. Yeah, and the fact she that just shows <laughs> in the fact that she chooses a red dress in order to when she decides she's going to leave the order, and I mean it's all of it is done for deliberate impact i mean obviously that is i mean obviously that is an extreme way of looking at this looking at the challenges of celibacy if you take on that responsibility and 
but at the same time, it's it it's you have this environment where you have these these women in a culture that they do not necessarily understand, confronted with people who live their lives in a completely different way that they do, and they look at what they're trying to do as helping and you know it's admirable that they're trying but at the same time you you look at it in terms of the the manner in which people who people the ways in which some people of faith feel like helping means to get people in touch with what the missionaries believe as opposed to helping helping people get in touch with what they believe and i i think that is one of the that's one of the things that's always kind of interesting about how films approach uh missionaries and i mean not just not just this film i you you think about scorsese's silence you think about yeah um the end of the six happiness with an amazing performance by Ingrid Bergman and the ways in which people who are nominally basically asking people to believe what they, what these, these outsiders believe it's, it's going to be a challenge. I mean, this is, this is obviously an extreme manner, but at the same time, it's, there are some people who are just not going to be up to, the challenge of accepting that there are people, there are people in the way that they choose to live in their lives that is just not going to be conducive to their beliefs. And it's the, the ways in which Powell and Pressburger, I think get to that is, is extreme, but it's also very compelling too, because of the fact that what we are seeing is, uh, is women who probably are, and it's not just Sister Clauda, it's really all of these women are kind of thrown in on the uh, deep end of how how to deal with this this type of life. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, it's, and we do, we do see how even the, the missionaries themselves struck, wonder if their way of life is the way to go yeah is the way to go yeah they even sister ruth like in a very even even as she shows just how far off it makes her go like she's i mean she's uh, she is someone with the very uh someone who really who doesn't want to who, who wonders whether uh i'm not quite sure how to say it well, I mean, and she's she's somebody who her her feelings towards Mr. Dean are very there we can we can understand where she's coming from. And we can yeah. you know, not necessarily in terms of why she feels that way towards that particular character, but why that is why she's starting to feel that way when presented with you know it's like it's one thing to say oh yes i'll you know abstain from all men all lust for lustful urges it's another thing to actually put that in practice and to be challenged in that way yeah is, exactly is going to be it's it's going to be difficult and i i think Again, so much of this is about challenging Sister Clauda and the way that she leads these women. And, you know, sometimes you get the impression that she uh, she has a good idea of what to do. There are other times where it's just going to be overwhelming to her. Yeah, and even as uh, somebody, sister, um, if Sister Ruth even, one reason she become Sister Ruth be becomes a foil to sister Clauda is because Ruth is very open about her carnal wants and needs mm-hmm. and feels like, and it feels like 
her line of work isn't right for her because she just happens to be to be sexually active and and she happens to be sexually active and she notices that and she's but unlike Cla- unlike Clauda who's like no no I no no yeah. I'm as I'm as clean as a I'm as clean as a whistle <laughs> she's she's like I'm as clean as a whistle now mm-hmm. she's like mean, Ruth can tell Clauda has feelings for her she's just she's just keeping them she's just like suppressing them as hard as she can yeah exactly yeah and um. <laughs> There, I, you know, and I, I think it's interesting that, you know, they, they're, so they have the uh, Indian general who is, they, he, they basically uh, own the palace that the sisters are, um, come into, and I, I, I think it's, it's, it's interesting the way that they, that Clauda deals with him wanting to learn about what they're teaching and you know he's it's he's he's an interesting character i think because of the fact that to to a certain extent i mean he's he kind of feels like somebody who is very eager to learn about christianity and to understand why these women believe the things that they believe but at the same time he's taking the wrong some some of a wrong approach to it even though i don't know that they're if if that makes any sense it he, he's because he's got a very cavalier way of uh talking talking about their uh what they're preaching and I, I will say it's like Mr. Mr. Dean to a certain extent is right when he says later in the movie about Jesus being very casual. And it's like, yeah, I kind of understand that. I, I, I think that's a good way of looking at. But um no, I, I, I think when we we are confronted with some of the locals and the way that they approach what the sisters are uh, talking about. I think that is, that is some of the more interesting parts of the movie. And it, it just, it just goes to show just how overwhelming this, this, uh, this situation is going to be for these women. Oh, definitely. Yeah. It's not just the physical ice, not just the isolation and the temperature. Yeah. Yeah. And I mean, it's 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 truly difficult not to not. It's truly difficult not to go back to the uh, cinematography and the music. I love the music in this movie by Brian Easdale. I think he does a fantastic job getting to the psychological nature of this this story, but, and then the cinematography by Jack Cardiff, which rightfully won Oscar is just absolutely yeah. breathtaking. Yeah, the uh, you're definitely right about this. I mean it's uh, if only if only I mean the drum the drum beats alone. Yeah. Alone. Sorta 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 get sorta get the adrenaline running. Like like this the scene towards the end where where as uh, Ruth is angrily repeating Claudia's name. Like, mm. the, like as the yeah, as the uh, drum starts pounding, you're just like, oh, you're just like, oh shit, <laughs> <laughs> stuff's about to hit the fan. Yeah, <laughs> stuff's about to hit the fan. Leap and and it it and it builds to a climax that is just absolutely jarring. I mean, it's one of the most famous images in the movie, but it doesn't make it any less shocking when you watch it. Because of the fact that it's like you you've seen somebody just go completely mad, and they and somebody with somebody with a sensible who's trying to be sensible, you just can't reason with that. And the way that they are 
trying to deal with is just absolutely it, it it makes for a riveting third act of the film that i just really love definitely i mean like the image like the image of sister ruth Cl- stepping out of the shadows it's like yeah. again even though she, there's no supernatural elements and she's not a woman pos- possessed it, it looks she's it's like she's like with how she's pale as a stepping out of the shadows, just pale as a ghost. Yeah, it, it's like it's like it just shows she's not only mentally gone, but even just how how far gone she is from the sister of me at the beginning of the film. Yeah, exactly. Um, and also, quick foreshadowing. Mm-hmm. And there's also a bit of foreshadowing in that moment. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. It it's uh, man, I this is this is such a this 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 is just such a wonderful body of work here we're watching and um I I I just can't I I just can't get enough of watching that movie. Watching it again this morning in preparation for this, I was struck all over again by what I loved about it in uh 2020 and i'm so glad that i i ended up picking it up uh from criterion shortly after watching it just because of the fact that i knew i wanted to own it and uh it it absolutely it it's such a fantastic film i are you do you have anything more you'd like to uh say about before we continue absolutely vision (laughs) This movie is just the one of the most, be- one of the most beautiful looking movies I have ever seen. If uh, like if, if there was ever an opportunity to see it, to see a repertory screening, I would. You know, if there was like a repertory screening, and, yeah. Like if I if I was if I was in New York and saw there was a repertory screening, I would take the next train there. Oh, absolutely. <laughs> that, I mean, like there's there's no, I mean you. It's just as effective at home, but I can only imagine just hearing the drum, hearing those drum sounds on a mm-hmm. on a big theater screen. Yeah. Oh my god. <laughs> my 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 world would probably alter. <laughs> yeah. I no. I I I don't. I I don't. I do not doubt that. That that would be that would be an extraordinary experience seeing this on big screen. And I mean, you know, it's like the. The the thing about it is, it's like the, you know the, the screen obviously is dramatically different now that we have, cinemascope that we have TV framing that we have you know we have flat we have, you know we have one eight five to one we have two three, nine to one but the fact that, all of these movies were shot in the, box screening. And just really, but you feel like they are all immersive in the way that they look and the way that they capture the type of tensions and the emotions that they're capturing is just absolutely amazing. And yeah, I I can't imagine what that movie would be like, what Black Narcissus would be on like on the big screen but I'm, I'm kind of like you I would almost I would love to find out because of the fact that it's such a it's it's a great experience at home but I I mean no movie I think no no experience I think can compare with being on the big screen but and I can't imagine that being anything less than extraordinary on the big screen absolutely yeah and I, I would definitely say that about the third film that we're talking about, which is, which was their next film, 1948's The Red Shoes. And the Red Shoes. I, <laughs> it, it's funny because when I, I, I tend to take notes when I'm, uh, when I'm working on prepping for a podcast. And I, I've got notes on all three of these movies, and so much of 
All I had to say about the red shoes is basically hyperbole. I usually don't do that, but the there's something just absolutely unbelievable about this film um, in the way that it looks, the way that it tells this story. And the the thing that is so remarkable about this is that it's it's arguably the simplest story of the three from a narrative standpoint. It's basically, yeah, it's your typical, it, it's basically your typical, um, backstage rivalries of a, an overbearing theater director, a composer who's wanting to, uh, who who's wanting to become a great composer and an ingenue who wants to be a star. I mean, three very traditional archetypes for this type of story. And yet the way that this story unfolds, it feels very natural. It doesn't feel like we're watching the same type of story we've seen dozens upon dozens upon dozens of times before. It has a lot of the same dynamics that we're used to. It has a lot of the second and third act complications that we're used to. It has a lot of, it has so many of the mechanics of the plot that we're used to but I can't I can't look away. I, I'm just that enthralled by the performances and by the filmmaking. And it's just remarkable what 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 Powell and Pressburg Burger do in this film. Absolutely. I mean norm, normally I don't like to normally I don't like to immediately compare one older film. I try not to compare films to another after I watch them, but after I saw the Red Juice for the first time, I couldn't help but think of Black Swan. Yeah, it definitely another movie about <laughs> ballet. Yeah, that definitely, <laughs> Except... to... <laughs> definitely came to it definitely came to mind while I was watching it too. Except this one is except it's a bit like Black Swan, except from the the direct the theater more from the theater director's point of view. Yeah. And obviously, it doesn't is... it doesn't go Sorry, into go psychological horror either. I mean, the the tensions in this movie feel very genuine, and uh, they don't feel overblown in uh, in in the same way that Black Swan does. But no, I I completely saw that comparison like almost immediately when I was um, when I was watching it. The the way that these the the way the Powell and Pressburger they the way that they bring us into the worlds of these movies I I think is fantastic and you have the opening stampede into the hall in this movie that just really that really just gets you into the rush of adrenaline that this movie is ultimately going to give us when it comes to its story and the way the story unfolds and the i i love there are moments in this film that feel very natural there um you know there are ideas in this movie that are very are very familiar to us the idea of what, do we choose our creative ambitions over love? Do we choose our our ambitions as you are our, our youthful ambitions greater than the professionalism of an old pro and the tensions of yeah. those and the way that the the red shoes ballet is created the way the ballets in general in this movie are created. It's just something we're watching 
we're we're watching something very intently in this film that is very mundane if you've ever worked on preparing a performance but at the same time we're captivated by it because of the way that Powell and Pressburger stage this film the way that they've chosen to tell this story and it's just absolutely it's it's beautiful it's it's beautiful and it's it's it, it's a remarkable film. Yeah. Yeah, keeping up, keeping up with, with the theme of the archers and visuals, even like the... Like one, I think one key visual is... Key and striking visual is the titular shoes themselves. Yes. Which are, which are so... In a film that has a very natural story, these... The bright-looking shoes... The bright-looking shoes appear as if they're a magical a magical object yeah yeah one yeah the symbol for norma shearer's in pursuit of fame even if they may be potentially as even if they may prove to be a cursed object for her mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. no absolutely and I, I it's the thing that one of the things that's so impressive to me about this film which, I mean, these are all basically equal films, but it feels like The Red Shoes is just a very tight notch above. Um, but, I mean, they're all excellent films. The, the way that they use cinematic technique when we are watching the production of The Red Shoes unfold. Like, there are things that you could never really make happen in those days on the stage that are very cinematic techniques but feel very natural when it comes to us watching the film in front of us it it feels like well yes of course this is happening and 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 it's to your point of the the red shoes of the title basically being magical objects in a very real way yeah. Yeah, and also uh, I get, also uh, I guess plays into the mo- plays into the technique of having supernatural weaving in element weaving elements of uh, fa- fantasy of the of fa- fantasy even if there's not a even if it's not a fantasy storyline. Yeah. I mean, in a way, I mean, it's it's funny because of the fact that, I mean, I, I think to a certain extent that plays into something that's very Hollywood, right? The idea of creating, creating art is something that is a very magical experience or we imagine it to be a magical experience, even if it's not necessarily that and i i think yeah. in a way this film is closer to a hollywood film than either of the other two films that we've talked about are right i guess which i guess makes sense as to why it's the only film by the archers to be nominated for best picture yeah oh yeah i mean and it it definitely uh yeah, I mean, it, it def- you, you can definitely see where Hollywood would have absolutely connected with this film entirely because of the fact that it's, it's just the, it's that type of movie that they would uh, resonate, that would completely resonate with them. Yeah, and as a movie, yeah, the fact that it's about, it's a stylized movie about show business about show business yeah and the the pursuit of artistic perfection i'm sure is what resonated with resonated with them Mm -hmm. yeah i still i still haven't seen hamlet the movie that it lost to but (laughs) uh what a deserving winner it would have been (laughs) it would have been it would have been no it would have been a fantastic winner um yeah i mean and look i'm i'm sure hamlet's fine but 
you know, okay. I I will like right now, like. I mean, I I adore the treasure of the Sierra Madre, but it's like I yeah. I mean, you wouldn't you wouldn't get any argument from me if Red Shoes had uh, won Best Picture. It's like okay, I I get it. It's 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 that good, and it it truly is. I I think it's an absolute uh, masterpiece. I I think it's it's a delightful film. I mean, I that is one of the things that I was so taken by with all three of these films that I mean. They really the the stories they tell are very different. The story, the subjects are very different. The way they approach the subjects are very different. But they all are entertaining in a lot of ways that we don't necessarily see coming right out of the gate. And I I think there, I I think there's. This is, you know, it's like Pell and Pressburger. I mean, they're famously two of the most beloved filmmakers from the era, certainly. And I think you can, and they definitely are filmmakers who had very distinctive ways of making their films. But the fact that they were able to go between genres, they they are that they did here it almost puts them out of step with the quote unquote great filmmakers of the era that i think we're kind of familiar with right like hitchcock yeah capra billy Wilder. Wilder. i mean Wilder. well Wilder's another filmmaker who could go between genres effortlessly but even uh, but even Wilder to Cucor. a certain extent yeah so the fact that they were able to do that in a way that grounded the films emotionally, but also gave audiences a good time in watching them is really, it, it's really quite amazing to consider when we think about these two. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. Well, um, is there anything that else that you want to say about the uh, archers before we wrap up? Well, if, well, if you want to, for any aspiring filmmaker, for any aspiring anyone who's an aspiring filmmaker, you, you should definitely and want to and want any a good influence or looking for a good visual influence, you should. I'd say look no further than. I'd say those. I would say those who are among the the top of top of the list of recommended filmmakers in that regard. Yeah, and uh, if you are not aware of this little piece of trivia, uh, Michael Powell was married to Thelma Schoonmaker, uh, Martin Scorsese's longtime editor, uh, at the end of his oh, life. I, so, I, I, um, did, I did not know that. Oh, I, I I think I, I think I knew I I forgot. Yeah, and Scorsese has listed Powell and Pressburger as a huge influence on him, and you can absolutely see that in the way he's told his own stories, and the way he looks at editing, the way he and Thelma look at editing. It makes a lot of sense that these two are part of that DNA in terms of. Yeah. telling stories and uh no it's uh it's absolutely uh it's it was fantastic to fantastic to finally watch these films and uh matt it was it was great to talk to you once again yeah it was great to great to talk with you as well yeah as always it's, it's always nice yeah it's nice to talk with you yeah yeah I'd like to thank Matthew for joining me on the podcast to discuss Palin Pressburger. It was great to talk to him again, and I do hope to have him on again in the future. That's going to be it for this episode of the Sonic Cinema Podcast. Uh, we've got an interesting lineup coming up, and I hope you uh, tune in for that. We've got some interesting uh, discuss discussions as well as some uh, guests coming up, and I'm looking forward to that. I 
Once again, click subscribe, rate, and review wherever you listen to podcasts. You can also check us out at patreon.com backslash Sonic Cinema, as well as www.sonic-cinema.com. Thank you very much. <laughs>